I want to read you just one thing here from our bulletin on Sunday before we begin tonight. This will be our last study in the book of Acts. We are finishing it tonight, Acts chapter 28. Uh, next week, next Wednesday, we'll start the book of Galatians. We'll be in the book of Galatians. Sunday nights, we're in Revelation chapter 20. That's going to take us a few more weeks to finish out the book of Revelation. But uh, next week, you can plan on uh, coming for the book of Galatians. And it's really a great book on centering ourselves in the grace of God. Amen? So I wrote here, will you surrender all to God? That's a good question. Most of us know that song, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. Uh, will you surrender all to God? Now some people believe only when they can see the end result. They won't believe until they can see the result. God asks us to believe first, and then that's when I'll have our eyes opened to see the results of trusting him. So a couple of scriptures, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the realization of things we hope for and the evidence of things we do not yet see. And then Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Great verse. Jesus said this, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Amen? So John, thank you for your obedience to the Lord doesn't have to make sense I look at the results of things yeah amen and the results are you were healed and we give God the praise for that amen amen would you stand with me we're gonna go ahead and uh, pray for I want to first of all I want to thank you all for being so faithful to attend this class on the book of Acts uh, someone said you're finishing in Acts chapter 28? And I said, yeah, that's the end of the book. And they said, what about Acts chapter 29? And I said, oh, that's us. Acts 29, we are the Acts of the Apostles now, amen? So Father, we just want to thank you for the time we've been able to spend together as a family and to learn all about all the wonderful things that you did with the Apostles, with the disciples, how you brought up so many to faith through the acts of the apostles. And so tonight, Lord, as we uh, finish our study in the book of Acts, I pray you will bless us and help us to glean out of this book what you want us, the church, to know. Lord, you said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So Lord, help us to hear your voice tonight, and help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers of the word as well. We'll give you thanks and praise, Father, for blessing us and teaching us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, church. You could be seated, and uh, we're going to start in Acts chapter 28. Brother, as always, thank you so much for the praise and worship. So in Acts chapter 28, we're going to study verses 25 through 31 and that will conclude the book of Acts so Paul concludes his message to the Jews and continues preaching the kingdom of God to everyone who would listen and that's the message of what we want to look at tonight is whosoever has an ear to hear let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church so not everybody's gonna believe not everybody's gonna listen but whoever has ears to hear let him hear. So in verse 25, we're going to read uh, 25 through 31. So when they did not agree among themselves, remember that the Jews believed some of the things that Paul spoke and other ones did not believe. So verse 25 says, when they did not agree among themselves, they departed after Paul had said one word. The Holy Spirit spoke rightly through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers saying, Go to this people and say, Hearing you will hear, but you will not understand. And seeing you will see, but you will not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that the salvation of God 
has been sent to the Gentiles, for they will hear it. And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had a great dispute among themselves. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came unto him. Remember now Paul is in Rome. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So, you know, that reminds me of that scripture that says, when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And so even the Roman guards did not harass Paul for preaching the gospel. So let's take a look at verse 25 again. The Jews did not agree with one another, and they began leaving, being obviously offended at Paul's words. And what were Paul's words? These people have blinded their eyes, they've closed their ears, their heart has become dull, they don't want to hear the word. Uh, who does that remind you of? Uh, that might be the place where we're living, you know, in the United States. So many people have just turned their ears away from the Lord, turned their eyes away from the Lord. Uh, so let's take a look at that, Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. One of the things God tells us in Psalm 133 is, Behold how good and how pleasant it is when the brethren dwell together in unity. Amen? So in the book of Amos, chapter 3 and verse 3, Amos asks a question. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No, they can't. If one wants to go north and the other one goes south, they're not going anywhere. Amen? So the Jews could not agree with what Paul was trying to teach them. So Paul reiterated and said, so now God's word is going to go out to the Gentiles because you've refused. And we have a, a whole chapter in the book of Romans that talks about a veil is now over their eyes because they've rejected the Lord. So let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 2.14. That one says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. Neither they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. So let's take a look at that verse. The natural man. The man who has a body and the man who has a soul, but his spirit is dead. He's not born again. His spirit is not alive. So the natural man doesn't receive God's things from the Spirit because it's only understood by the Spirit. So, in other words, if I spoke the Greek language to you, there wouldn't be anyone in here that understands it, except me and the Lord. Okay? If I spoke German to you, only people in this congregation who understood German would be able to discern what I was saying. So God is saying the same thing. It's, I really liken it unto a 3D movie. You go to a 3D movie, and you pay a little extra, and they give you these glasses to wear. And it's amazing, when you put the glasses on, it seems like all the people on the screen are coming out of the screen towards you. I don't know how they do that. But without the glasses, it's just blurry. And so God is saying, people that aren't born again, people that don't have the Spirit of God, everything we try to tell them is blurry to them. They don't get it because it's only understood by the Spirit. How many of you, before you got saved, attempted to read the Bible? And it made no sense to you at all. It was com completely up in the air. What does this mean? But after you got saved, it was you couldn't get enough. You would read and totally understand, and God would open up the Word to you, and it was amazing how, how the Holy Spirit then teaches us and, and brings all things to our remembrance. So that's all Paul's saying there is they couldn't agree with one another, so they got offended and walked out. In verses 26 through 27, that's where Paul quoted the prophet Isaiah. Remember, you've, you've dulled your eyes, you've dulled your ears, you've dulled your heart, you don't want to hear. So God is going to go to the Gentiles instead. So let's read about that, Isaiah chapter 6. And you know the word of God is powerful. And people get really offended if they're not walking with the Lord and they hear God's word. It's very offensive to them. It's like being hit right in the stomach. 
Uh, God's word is alive. It's full of power. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. The Bible says it's an understander or a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. In other words, you can't hide from God. God's word is alive. Let me give you a, a personal example. I was raised in a in a family that were givers. They were all big givers. You know, people come to the house and offer you food, even if you said you weren't hungry, you had to eat anyway. Uh, if, you were, if you needed money, if they had money, they would give you money. If you needed clothing, uh, it's just the way we were raised. We were raised as givers, okay? So in, in giving, somebody has to receive. Somebody has to receive. If there's no receivers, givers aren't happy. Okay, and we don't want to be just receivers. We want to be givers and receivers. So let's take a look at Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom will I send? Who will go for us? Notice us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. And he said, go and tell this people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they would see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. So there's a place where if we refuse to receive, if we refuse to hear the word of the Lord, if we refuse to obey, we harden our heart. And God tells us in scripture, don't harden your heart. We have to receive as well as give. Okay, so in Hebrews 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. The Bible says, starting with verse 15, while it is said, just as I just said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all of those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom he was angry 40 years. Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness or in the desert? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter into his rest, but to those who did not obey? So then we see that they could not enter in because of their unbelief. And remember, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. They refused to hear the word. So they didn't have any faith to believe. They couldn't agree with each other, and they left. They were offended. Okay, Hebrews 11, verse 6 says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And boy, I think a lot of people pass over the diligently seek him. Amen? Then we want to look at John chapter 6. The book of John, the sixth chapter, and verse starting with verse 35. John 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you don't believe. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. Now the one who comes to me, I will in, by no means cast out. So I've met people who were truly saved, who were afraid God was going to cast them out. And I said, look, if the Father drew you, and you actually came to Jesus, he promises he will not cast you out. 
you may be convicted, you may be chastised, uh, God may correct you, but he will not throw you out. I mean, think about human parents. Let's talk about two-year-olds, okay? Uh, most of you know the terrible twos, okay? That's what they call them anyway. Uh, children start to become independent at around two, two and a half years old. They want to, now they can walk and run, and they want to reach out and find different things. And typically, a lot of times, they're, unless the parents really corral them, they just go wild. Okay, not every child, but a lot of child children do. Barbara, you had nine of them. Can you agree with me on that, the terrible twos? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. So can you imagine, Barbara, if she's sitting at the table with her nine children and her and her husband are sitting there and one of them acts up. Can you imagine Barbara getting up, taking the child by the hand, taking them into the bedroom, unpacking their suitcase, throwing in all their clothes, shutting the suitcase, throwing the suitcase out on the lawn and telling that child, you're no longer my child, get out of here. No. As a human parent, you would never do that. You would probably apply the uh, rod of correction to the seed of knowledge and, and allow them to, to understand, amen, which I saw you do several times in church. So that's what a parent would do. Well, think about this. Barbara's just a human being. We're just human beings. Would a perfect God do something that we wouldn't even do? God says, I will in no way cast you out. We just have to believe that. He said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all that he has given me, I would lose nothing, but I will raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. We should never have a doubt. We are going to be raised up at the last day. We will all who believe will be raised up at the last day. Now the Jews complained about him and said, he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Well, I'm sure the Jews knew the, the book of Proverbs. Those are the writing of Solomon. Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. And so here's what they were doing, leaning to their own understanding. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. Did you realize that Jesus just said in five verses, three times, I will raise you up at the last day. I will raise you up at the last day. I will raise you up at the last day. Three times in five verses, he wants us to believe that we're going up. There's people out there that are preaching false doctrine, stuff that's not even biblical. They're, they're saying there is no rapture, there is no, Jesus isn't coming to take anybody home. Well, why would he go to heaven and prepare a place for us if he wasn't going to come again? He said, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. The Jews just couldn't buy it. So let's take a look at Romans chapter 11, the book of Romans in the 11th chapter, and verses 8 through 11. Again, talking about people who harden their hearts. Okay, just as it is written, verse uh, Hebrews, or excuse me, Romans eleven, verse eight. God has given them a spirit of stupor. I heard a guy preach one time. God has given them a spirit of stupid. I said, no, it's not stupid. It's stupor. Okay, it's kind of stupid, but it's stupor. Eyes that should not see, ears that should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table then become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Well, certainly not. 
but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, God sent his salvation to the Gentiles. Amen. And you know, unfortunately, what happens with a group of people when you find out I'm God's chosen, they got some pride in there. Hey, we're special. Everybody else is, you know, not special, but we are. And let it never happen to us as believers. We are saved by grace through faith. That isn't even of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. The Bible tells us in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we did, but according to God's mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration, that's the blood of Jesus, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. What did he mean by that? We lost the Holy Spirit with Adam and Eve. We lost the permanent dwelling of the Holy Spirit with us with Adam and Eve when they sinned. And the Holy Spirit never came back to, to dwell in us until Jesus rose from the dead and went back to heaven. Jesus said, if I don't go, then I can't send the comforter to you. But if I go, I will send the comforter to you. So let's read about that a minute because he lives in us. He witnesses to us. So let's turn to John chapter 14. And verse 26. All about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in verse 25, I have spoken these things to you while I was yet present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he, not it, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance things that I said to you. Look at John 15, 26. You were in John 14, 26. Look at the same verse next chapter. Now when the Helper comes, who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Now I had some people say, well, that was only for the apostles. No, uh-uh. The Bible says he chose us before the foundation of the world. We've been with him since the beginning. He chose us before the foundation of the world. God is not a respecter of persons. It's not just for the apostles. It's for all of us. All of us who believe. Okay? And then look at John chapter 16 and verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. So if you have any question at all, remember you have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can tell you exactly what he wants you to hear. Now there is one qualification for that. God can speak to us no matter what. It really helps if we hide God's word in our heart. Because then God can use his word to speak to us directly. Amen? So um, in verse 28, Paul tells the Jews that God is going to save the Gentiles. Man, that was like a slap in the face. For all those thousand years, the Jews got into the position where we're God's people. We don't even fellowship with the Gentiles. We don't talk to the Samaritans. We're not going to have any dealings with the Gentiles. We're not going to let anybody else come into our temple. They can come in the outer, outer court, but that's it. They're not coming into the temple. And, and that raised a lot of pride because God so loved the world. The world. That was his plan from the beginning. But he chose a peculiar people to prove to us as a human beings that the human spirit doesn't want to obey. It doesn't matter who God chose. The human spirit will rebel. That's why it's so important to be led of the spirit, not led of the flesh. So in verse uh, 28, Paul tells the Jews, God's going to save the Gentiles. So let's take a look at that prophecy in Isaiah 49. Isaiah chapter 49, and starting with verse 5.
49.5. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. For I will be glorious in the eyes of the Lord. My God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, so that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. He's talking about Jesus there. And then in Romans chapter 9, and that's what we've been talking about, about that veil. So in Romans, the ninth chapter, God explains what really happened to Israel. And so in Romans chapter 9, and starting with verse 14, Paul writes about Israel's rejection of Christ. He explains all of that. And then in verse 14 he says, So what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. He said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then, it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs. But it's of God who shows mercy. Sometimes we think if we do more good things, we'll be in tighter with the Lord. It's not about that at all. God chooses whom God will choose, period. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And if you read the story of Moses and Pharaoh and, and their their discussions back and forth, you'll see Pharaoh just kept hardening his heart. He kept mistreating the children of Israel. And you, you wonder, even in our country, what meaneth that in Washington? Well, apparently, God has raised him up to be the leader of the nation because that's what America has desired. God says, you want it your way? Fine, have it your way. You know, you don't want Bibles in your schools. You don't want God in, in the center of your government. You, you don't want morality anymore. Fine, here you go. And I think that's exactly what God did with Pharaoh, and I think that's exactly what God is doing with people who reject him. So in verse 18, Therefore God will have mercy on whom he will, and he will harden whom he will. You say to me then, why does he still find fault? Who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me this way? Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? That's one of the things I wondered in, in, uh, in the story of Moses. When is the Lord going to smack this guy? When is the Lord going to take Pharaoh out? And then ten times, and still nothing. It wasn't until the Red Sea. And so I think we wonder in our day and age, when is enough enough? God will decide that. The Lord will decide when enough is enough. And I tell you, when God decides enough's enough, cover your head. <laughs> Amen. Make sure you're saved. It is a fearful thing to follow the hands of a living God. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he said in the book of Hosea, I will call them my people, who were not my people, and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, 
There they shall be called the sons of the living God. Hey, that's us, church. That's us. We've been called by the Lord. And now we're the sons of God. We weren't before. Israel were the sons of God. But now God has included us in that grace. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Verse 27. Though the number of the children of Israel are as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. Does anybody know what a remnant is? It's between 10 and 15%. Think about that. If you go to any carpet store and you say, yeah, do you have any remnants left? Usually they'll say, yeah, there's a piece over there and it's some odd cut, uh, cut piece of carpet. It's usually 10% of what the original carpet was, at the most 15. And what did Jesus say? Narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. But broad is the way, and many be that go in thereat. So he goes on in verse 28, and he says, For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabbath has left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been made like Gomorrah. What should we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained unto righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. See, the Jews sought it by the law. The Jews sought it by doing all the things that God commanded them, which no one can ever do. Now the Gentiles, we as Gentiles, we pursue that righteousness by faith because why? We are the righteousness of God through faith in Christ. He is our righteousness. We can't do enough righteous things to get into heaven. God is our righteousness. So in verse 31, Israel pursuing the law of righteousness did not attain to the law of righteousness. No one can. Verse 32, why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, they were seeking it by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. What did God say there? I'm going to send Jesus to the earth, and I'm going to send him from the tribes that I've been trying to save. And they're going to stumble at him, they're going to crucify him. They're going to reject him. And so I'm going to go to the Gentiles. Verse 29. Well, when Paul spoke all these things, his words were a stumbling block to the Jews. They stumbled over his words as well. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, so we want to go to 1 Peter, the second chapter. Is this tying it in for you tonight he's talking about righteousness by faith and sharing that faith because of the great grace God has bestowed upon us so first Peter chapter 2 verses 6 through 10 therefore it is also contained in the scripture behold I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone it's talking about Jesus elect and precious and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, he is the stone which the builders rejected. He has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Wow, the gift of God, eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We were shut out, brother. We were shut out until Jesus came and Paul and the others were sent to the Gentiles. Verse 30. 
So Paul is in Rome. He's already been rejected by the Jews. They've walked away. They stumbled at his words, just like they stumbled at Jesus. So what does Paul do now? Paul welcomes everybody who would come to him. Paul just threw the doors open and said, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and deal with these people who argue with me all the time. Whosoever will, let him come. And one of them that was in his house was a Roman soldier. And it is my belief that that Roman soldier received Christ as his Savior. I don't think he could hang around the Apostle Paul very often and, and hear what Paul had to say to all of his visitors and not get saved. Amen? This pastor in Southern California said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Think about that. Uh, the Bible puts it this way. Bad company corrupts good manners. So good company promotes good manners. Amen? God says who, who you hang with is who you become. That's why it's so important to be in fellowship with other believers. It's so important to do that. So Paul welcomed everybody that came to him. So John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, echoes that heart of the Lord. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. So Paul literally preaches the Word to whoever will listen to him. Now, I know it's a temptation sometimes to try to explain to people who Jesus is. They're not going to understand that. But if you preach the word to them, just give them the Bible verses. The Bible says, my word that goes forth out of my mouth shall not return to me void. It will accomplish that which I please. And it will prosper in the thing that I send it to do. So, uh, John chapter 1 Verses 10 through 13, this was the heart of Jesus. John 1, verse 10 through 13. And this is what we've been talking about so far here. Verse 10 said, Jesus was in the world, but, and the world was made through him, and the world didn't know him. He came into his own. Who were his own? The Jews. He came into his own, verse 11, but his own did not receive him. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now that's a tricky statement right there because it's not a believe up here. Look, the devil believes and trembles. Amen? Yeah, it's not that kind of believe. It's a complete heart trust it's a complete leaning on Jesus with everything you have, totally throwing yourself on him. So if, let's just say we, one of us tonight had to stand before the Lord. And let's say if it were possible for him to say, why should I let you into my kingdom? Why should I let you? I think the only answer anyone could ever give if you're a believer is because I've totally completely relied upon your death, burial, and resurrection for my salvation. You shed your blood for me, and that's the only reason you should receive me into your kingdom. Man, if you started touting off, well, hey, I read my Bible for 30 years, and I preached the gospel for 10 years, and man, I gave half my money to the church, and I swept the church, and I painted the church, and I, you start naming all that, you're climbing up some other way. That's what believe means. Believe means you throw everything on the Lord. You have no, nothing that you do by yourself to get you there. That's the kind of believe. It's, it's the Greek word pistevo, which means to totally and completely rely upon Christ. Only Him. So in verse 31, as we close tonight, through all of this, what was Paul doing? He was preaching the gospel. Paul was trying to win souls. He was trying to bring people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ so they could be saved. That's all he was doing. And so let's take a look at some scriptures here, and some of them you don't have to look up. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says, this is from the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God to save 
everyone who believes, the Jew first and also to the Greek or the Gentile. So the first thing Paul says in the church of Rome is, you know what, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And then in Romans chapter 10, if you'll turn there with me. <laughs> I'm not going to say who it was. But when I was preaching in Avila, someone said to me, is that all you can talk about is being saved in Jesus? <laughs> well, what else is there to talk about? I mean, really, when, when I get together with Tony or Jack or Pastor Joe or Barbara or any, John, anyone here, David, what do we talk about? We talk about the Lord. What else is there to talk about? You know, oh, we could do small talk. Oh, gee, the sun looks nice today. You know, the, isn't the grass green? You know, okay, that's true, but how's that going to bring any edification to anybody? We talk about the goodness of the Lord. And so in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, actually start with verse 8, Paul asks this question of the church of Rome. What does it say? Well, the word is near you and in your mouth and in your heart. And that's the word of faith, which we preach. Here he is again. Paul's just preaching the word of faith. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be, you will be saved. Because it's with your heart one believes unto righteousness, and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I've shared this story before, but I had a friend, uh, she went to one of the big churches in town, and uh, her life totally changed. And so I, after I got saved, I wanted to know when did you get saved? I know when I got saved. November 4th, 1980, at 2.30 in the morning. I know the hour, I know the day, I'll never forget that day or that hour. But I wanted to know, when did you actually get saved? And she said, well, I, I went to the church, and the pastor was preaching on the love of Jesus and the cross. And during that message, it was like my heart was burning. And the pastor said, if there's people here that haven't been saved and you want to be saved, why don't you stand up and come forward? He said, Jesus never called anybody privately. He called them all publicly. The only one that really snuck out privately was Nicodemus, and he wanted to know how to get saved. And later he had to come out publicly when they begged the body of Jesus. He was with Joseph of Arimathea, and his cover was blown. That was it. So Jesus calls people publicly. So I said, so when did you get saved? And she said, well, I, I stood up and I came forward and somebody met me up there and they, they shared some verses with me again and I prayed with them. And I said, I didn't ask you that. I asked you, when did you get saved? And she said, honestly, I got saved when I stood up. And that made perfect sense to me because with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation it's not with the mouth it's with the heart and when I pray with people to receive Jesus after I've talked to them about the gospel I tell them look if you just pray this prayer to get me out of your hair nothing's going to happen if you don't believe in your heart nothing's going to happen it's just empty words so I'm not going to pray with you unless you really believe in your heart the things that I've shared with you and they say, I, I believe. God, God knows my heart. I believe. And then I pray with them. Because I don't want to give someone a false feeling that they're on their way to heaven by praying some words and they don't even believe it or mean it. Amen? So he said, with the heart one believes unto righteousness and then with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, because the same Lord over all is rich unto all who call upon him. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. So if you want people to hear, give them the word of the Lord. Now, before I accepted Jesus, you guys have heard this story, I don't know, 39 times now. But <laughs> that's a low estimate. Uh, before I got saved, people were telling me the word of God. Quote me John 3.16. Uh, the last person quoted me Matthew 13, 49, and 50. So I got heaven, I got Jesus, I got hell, all that word. And that word began to work on my spirit. And the night I got saved, there was no one in my house but me. And when I got saved, all that word came back. And all that understanding bore fruit. Because the word that goes forth out of my mouth will not return unto me void, says the Lord. It will accomplish that which I set it to do, and it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So God's word is always, it's, it's like planting a seed in the ground. And then the next day you come and you go, well, where is it? Well, it's in the ground. It has to die first. And then you water it. That's how we water it. And then somebody else comes along and waters it, maybe a few more scriptures, and pretty soon it pops up through the earth. And that's exactly how it works in the kingdom of God. And you all know that. 2 Timothy chapter 4. So in our case, and in Timothy's case, Paul was telling Timothy, if you really want to obey God, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Paul was a little bit more forward than I like to be. <laughs> Can you imagine if I said, I command you to do this? Well, that's what Paul did to Timothy. Paul said, I charge you. That's a command. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom. You are to preach the word. You are to be ready in season and out of season to convince to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering or patience and teaching. Because the time is coming when they will not listen to sound teaching or doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. They will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Brother Tony and I walked, talked about that before this service, how. We're shocked sometimes what we hear behind a pulpit. It's like, what, what verse is that? What Bible verse is that? What, what teaching is that? And so it's so important to do what God said to do. Just share the word. God's powerful enough to do what he needs to do with the word. Verse 5 says, you're to be watchful in all things. And then he promises this, you have to endure afflictions. You mean I'm going to get attacked? Yeah, you are. Yep. And we just have to get to the place where we just say, I'm not going to be offended when that happens. Because I know that's what happens when the truth comes out. So endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Jesus said the same thing to his disciples, which we are as well. We're his disciples as well. Disciples means taught ones. So we're all being taught. Some of us are being sent, but most of us are being taught. Okay, so Matthew 28, the last three verses. I've said this before, usually during a phone call, the phone call starts out, Hi Ed, how you doing? Just call to see how everything's going. By the way, you know, and then you give them the purpose of your phone call, and then you close the phone call. So typically, if you're listening to a phone conversation, pay special attention to what comes at the end, because that's usually the purpose of the phone call. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. 
But Jesus felt it was the most important thing to share it at the end. So this is what he said, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. I like that. He was letting them know, I'm the boss. I make the decisions. I have all the authority. Don't worry about what the enemy or anyone else does. I have all the authority. Okay, verse 19. He just simply says, go. Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So I want to tell you what happened to me in Pastor Robles a year ago. So me and Louis and Cal... I think just the three of us were left on the ride. We started out with 10 and people had to leave and go home. and So we decided to go up to Paso Robles. So uh, as is our custom, after eating early in the morning, we wanted something sweet. So we stopped at a donut shop. And we went in the donut shop and uh, there was a woman behind the counter. She looked to be probably in her late 50s, early 60s. And we walked in and... Uh, she looked at us and was incredibly friendly to us. And we bought some donuts and some coffee. And then she began talking back and forth to us. And Louis said, Greg, I think she's flirting with you. <laughs> she was just being friendly. So I said, well, you know what? Maybe that's the Lord opening up the door for us to talk to her about the Lord. So I got up out of my chair and uh, went up to the counter and I said, has anyone ever told you about Jesus before? She just kind of looked at me like this and she goes, why would you ask me that? And I said, because I like to tell people about Jesus. Has anyone ever told you? And she said, my uncle is a pastor in the Philippines. And I said, praise God, how about yourself? And she said, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I, I was raised in the church, etc. But I've kind of slid away from that. And so I said, can we pray for you? And that's when I dragged them up with me. <laughs> I love doing that too. Involve people in ministry with you. Amen? It's, it's not all about any one of us. It's about Jesus. So Louis got up and Cal got up and we went and stood at the counter and there was no one else in the donut shop. And we held hands with her and we prayed over her. And we prayed that God would open her heart and open her spirit and, and help her to get back to walking with the Lord. Amen? And, and so we, we left her a nice tip, and we left, got on our bikes, and that was a year ago. So last Tuesday, what's day? Yesterday, we went back to that donut shop. And it was so cool how God worked things out. We walked in, and the minute we walked in, she goes, Pastor! I remember you. How are you? I never told her I was a pastor. You know? <laughs> My coat says Windex on it. <laughs> okay. If you guys are paying attention. But she came out from behind the counter and gave me a hug. And she said, I am doing so good. Things are going good in my life. I'm looking towards the Lord. And this time we had six, six of us. We had double the amount. So we all just sat there. Reuben was with us, brother. And we just rejoiced. We went outside and had our donuts and coffee. And she came outside afterwards and took a picture of us all riding away. And so think about that. All we did was give her a gospel tract and plant a seed. And then we prayed for her this, this last year. Whenever she would come to my mind, I would pray for her. And I'm sure Louie and Cal did as well. Is God able? God is able. God says go and make disciples. Now, you know as well as I do, look around. The city of Santa Maria isn't going to come to church. <laughs> They're not going to come here. So we have to go to them. And, and so during our walk about town or drive around town or wherever we go shopping, there's always an opportunity to pl just plant a seed. My buddy, who's been my friend since 1976, I'm not sure how many years that is. It's a lot of years. Uh, 47, I think. Yeah, 47 years now. Ben and I have been friends. 
John gave me a bunch of those chick tracks. By the way, I need some more, brother. Yeah, he's, run, he's running out. Uh, that was his forte. You know, Ben's, if you've ever talked to him here in church, he's very quiet. Uh, he'll let you talk, and he doesn't say much, right? Pastor Joe, you guys go out to lunch once in a while. He's very quiet. But man, does he like to pass out them chick tracks. So they're little books, they're little cartoon books that you can witness with. And every time we go to a restaurant now, he'll pull one out and say, which one? I'll look at him and say, well, it's not, not Halloween yet, so why don't we pick this one? And he'll insist that we leave it on the table with a tip. Now that's a seed. And I'll tell you what, that guy who witnessed to me in the Lompoc prison when I delivered Coca-Cola there, he gave me a gospel tract. And it was like a chick tract. It was several pages, but it was called Four Spiritual Laws. And I kept that tract for a whole year. And the night I got saved, that's the tract I read that opened my eyes to Jesus. So you never know. And I, I realize it's, you know, not everybody's cut out to get in front of people and talk to people. Not everybody's, you know, can go into a place and just reach out to people. I get that. But everybody can pull out a track and say, I'd like you to have this. Amen? So I think it's important that we witness, especially in these days. Does, has anybody heard of Pastor Jack Hibbs? He's, uh, I think, Pastor of Calvary Chapel, isn't he? Yeah, pretty, pretty well-known one. He uh, sent a three-minute video today on the fact that Israel is at war. Russia has stirred up Syria. Uh, somebody else stirred up Iran and they're all being confederate now and coming against Israel and that's exactly what Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39 are, are all about. So it's all about nations gathering together and if you read Daniel chapter 11, it's the same thing. So he was just saying, something's going to happen. He said, they're all coming against Israel. Israel's at war. And he was talking about, could the rapture be sooner than we thought? And it was just another seed to let me know, man, I better be about my father's business. You know, I mean, I can have fun and still be about my father's business. You know, I can ride a motorcycle or ride a bicycle or go for a walk. I, it's, to me, it's enjoyable, but I can still be about my father's business. Amen? We can still be about our father's business. And so I want to close with Mark 16. Because more and more as we look out there and we see all the uh, things that people are doing to their bodies, there's actually some creatures out there. But God's got that covered too in Mark chapter 16. In Mark 16 verse 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <laughs> So, I was at the Harley shop Friday night for what they call a bike night. It's not my favorite thing. It's a bunch of guys with loud motorcycles. They're blasting their pipes. And, but we go there as black sheep to be servants. That's why we go there. We go there to serve food, serve you know the soft drinks and whatever, and just be a servant. And it gives us an opportunity to speak to people. So these guys walked in, and I'm not going to say what motorcycle club they, they are, but they're uh, very well-known and very violent. And they're, they're not, it's the state law now, they are not allowed to wear their patch. But this guy was wearing his patch. He was about, well, you can ask Corey. He, I think he was about 6'8". Corey said he was 6'10", whatever he was. He was a whole body higher than I was. And... Corey, uh, we were all sitting there serving, and Corey said, somebody needs to witness to him. So you know the two chaplains that come here to witness? He looked at Dan, and he goes, you're a chaplain. Why don't you go witness to him? <laughs> Dan, Dan said, I'm busy. <laughs> so I kept hearing him talk, and I thought, well, they're just people. I don't care if they're six foot nine. They're, they're just people. So... I pulled out a, a gospel track and I walked up and I was just saying, Lord, show me when. Because there was five or six of them together. 
and he was signing something at a table for some drawing. So when he was done, he turned around, and I said, how you doing? And he looked at me, and he goes, okay. And I reached out my hand, and I introduced myself, and he took my hand and shook it. His name was Strangle. Gee, I wonder what he does. <laughs> I thought, well, <laughs> hopefully he won't use his gift on me. <laughs> All the bikers have names, you know, Tattoo Mike and Crazy Freaky Fred and Crazy Joe. And that's just, they all do that. So his, his name was Strangle. So I said, well, hey, uh, we're with the Black Sheep Motorcycle Ministry, and we like to hand these out, and I'd like you to have one. And so he looked at it. He turned it around, started reading it. He goes, okay. And I said, thanks for taking it. You know, glad you came tonight. And that was the end of that. I planted a seed. You got to remember, in April, no, probably even January of 1980, that inmate at the prison in Lompoc gave me a gospel tract. And what did I do? I went home and hid it. I wanted nothing to do with that whatsoever. But a year later, God had touched my heart and I looked everywhere where I had hidden it and I found it and read it and got saved. So we never know if Strangle is going to get saved, but if he does, he's coming to this church. <laughs> he's from Southern California. I'm going to have him come and share his testimony. So all I'm saying is I didn't do much, but I did what God says here. And we can do what God says here. It's, it's not hard. They're just people. And a lot of them have a big facade on, so you'll leave them alone. And that's just nothing but a trick from the enemy. You know, well, I don't want to talk to that guy. That guy looks mean. Well, I'm sure the Apostle Paul looked pretty mean, too, when he was dragging people out of houses. And I'm sure some of us looked pretty mean before somebody told us about Jesus. But somebody told us. And, and we're going to close with Mark 16, 15. He said... Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, God could have said, he who believes and is baptized and attends church and, and gives to the kingdom of God, etc., 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 will be saved. Because that's the things that happen when you get saved. You start following Jesus. But notice what it takes to be damned, to be judged, to, to, to go to hell. He that believes not will be condemned. There's no, didn't get baptized, didn't tithe, didn't, didn't read his Bible. No. The only way to be condemned is to not believe. Verse 17. Now these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And boy, have we seen a bunch of that here. Laying hands on the sick and God heals them. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. So what did the disciples do? Last verse. They went out and they preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirm the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. That's why we don't follow signs. We don't follow wow. We preach the word and God confirms the word with signs. We preach the word, somebody gets saved. Isn't that a sign? We preach the word, somebody gets healed. Isn't that a sign? We preach the word and somebody decides, I need to quit doing what I'm doing and start doing this. That's a sign. So I want to encourage everyone here. And, and you know, someone asked me, are you, are you a called preacher? I said, eh, I don't know if I preach much. I teach. But I really think I'm a stationary evangelist. You know, God sends people to me, and I love to walk in the spirit of evangelism. So find out what your gift is and use it for the glory of God. Amen? Find out what it is. If it's prayer... Use it for the glory of God. 
If it's planning a gospel track like Ben, do it for the glory of God. If it's listening to someone and weeping with them and praying with them, do it to the glory of God. Amen. Would you stand with me? That concludes our study on the book of Acts. I hope you've enjoyed the book of Acts. Uh, you should have lots of these pages. <laughs> and you can go back over them and share them with others if you wish. I, I like what Sopita does. She takes all the leftover notes and she puts them back in on the table for the Saturday church. And she calls it, I think it's spiritual food. She has a little sign back there, spiritual food. And there's a whole pile of them back there that people can just take and go home and study them. It's the word of the Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for our time together tonight. Lord, I pray as uh, Pat and her daughters go to pick up Robert from the airport that you give them safe travel and bring him and them back home safely, Lord. I, I pray for each one here tonight, Lord. Father, I've tried to share just some special things that you've done in my life, not that I'm anybody, but you'll use whoever is willing, Lord. And uh, I just pray that will happen among us more and more, that we would really be heaven-centered and salvation-centered. There's so many people out there that are so confused, Father. They're so, so away from you, so lost. And I just pray that you use us for your glory to reach those whom you send us to. Lord, we can't win the whole world, but we can go to our part of the world and share with those who are hungry. So I just pray that prayer, Father, in faith, believing that you're going to allow that to happen. As you said in your words, some plant some water, but God gives the increase. So Lord, it's not about us. It's about the seed and it's about the watering and it's about you getting the increase. So we want to thank you for this study and ask that you bless us now as we meet again uh, next week as we start the book of Galatians. Lord, please be here with us. Teach us. Show us what we need to know as we go into these last days. We'll thank you for it. Bless now, I pray, as we dismiss in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. God bless you, church. Hope to see you on Sunday if you're able to make it. Uh, please pray for me. I don't know what the message will be yet, but I'm sure, I'm sure it'll be the word of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Punishment that was due for our peace was laid on.